Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Arsenal Museum on, in fact, not just in Rock Island, Illinois, but literally on Rock Island. Uh, this is a big arsenal complex, uh, still an active US military arsenal, and they have a really cool small arms museum here that they have graciously allowed me to do some videoing in. So what we're looking at today is an extremely cool and very weird piece of firearms technology. This is Winchester's entry into the 1964 SPIW program, uh, or I'm sorry, the 1962 program rifles were delivered in 64. Um, SPIW stands for Special Purpose Infantry Weapon, and the genesis of this whole program really goes back to 1952, when the Ordnance Department, or uh, one guy in, in the US military, published um, a report looking at the actual causes, the, the lethality of rifle and machine gun wounds. Like, how effective are these weapons? And what he found was that uh, ninety percent of rifle and machine gun fire, uh, ninety percent of the wounds caused by rifle and machine gun fire were caused at three hundred yards or less, and eighty percent of those wounds were caused at two hundred yards or less. And the conclusion that he came to was that the accuracy of a particular rifle or machine gun is basically irrelevant. You know, there's this very long tradition of marksmanship in the U.S. Army, and what uh, what this report was finding was that this is all basically a pointless exercise in winning matches, and doesn't really have much relevance to war fighting. The issue was, it didn't matter if you had a one minute of angle rifle or a five minute of angle rifle, what actually determined whether uh, an enemy was hit or not had nothing to do with the accuracy of the weapon. It was all about how long was the enemy exposed and how much of them was exposed. Some guy stands up in broad view and stays still, he's going to get hit give, you know, in that exact same situation, even if the soldier has an absolute laser beam of a rifle, if the enemy only exposes a small part of himself, and only for a very brief time, he's not getting hit. And so this report, the Hitchman report, found that, you know, we could double the dispersion of any given infantry weapon in US inventory, and it wouldn't have any impact on, on that weapon's ability to cause enemy casualties. So this really flew in the face of Ordnance Department tradition and thinking and doctrine and everything. But what the report suggested was that the US military should develop a system that basically builds in more dispersion. And this led to what was called the SALVO program, which uh, ran from 1952 until 1960. And SALVO looked at uh, a couple, couple different solutions. They looked at duplex and triplex cartridges, where you have one cartridge case with two or three bullets in it that all fire as one. That was the really simple solution, and that was actually the solution that was recommended at the end of this program. But that wasn't all. They also looked at small caliber high velocity cartridges, uh, because this was before the 5.56 cartridge, before the M16. They found that, uh, in fact, they did testing with a T48 full auto US made FAL rifle that had been rechambered for basically 7.62 NATO neck down to 22 caliber with like a 41 grain bullet. And they found it, even it wasn't really all that practical or beneficial in full auto. And then they also experimented with flechette cartridges, where you have basically a 10 to 15 grain little dart that's fin stabilized. And they tested this in Project Salvo by stuffing a bunch of these things, like 30 of them, into a 12 gauge shotgun shell. And they were testing with a Remington 1187. Now, the result of Salvo was nothing entirely conclusive. Um, the, the formal, con the formal uh, recommendation at the end was that the US actually develop a duplex 7.62 NATO cartridge and issue it. But that never happened, largely I think because how on earth do you win at Camp Perry with duplex cartridges? You can't, so it's not going to happen. However, uh, the program continued into a second phase, and that was Project SPEW. And in that one, well, SPEW didn't start until, well, there, there's, there's a significant time gap between the actual testing of the Salvo rifles, which was like 1956, and the order for SPEW rifles, which was in 62. And most of this time was taken up with um, Advanced Armament uh, Incorporated, AAI, trying to develop a, an effective single shot flechette cartridge. They had kind of liked what they were seeing with these flechettes loaded in a shotgun shell. The problem was they were low velocity. You know, you're talking 12 or 1300 feet per second. You know, it's shotgun velocities. And they wanted to try these at like 
hypervelocity. So they were going, they were aiming for 4,000 feet per second, which is like 1,300 meters per second, really, really fast. And it took AAI a long time to figure out how to do this effectively. So there were two ways that they could look at these flechette cartridges. One was to have a sabo at the front that pulls the flechette, and one was to have a sabo at the back that pushes the flechette. And the, the one at the back was the much simpler technical solution. The problem was that meant all of your gunpowder had to be behind the pusher, behind the sabo, which was in turn behind the flechette. And this made for a very long cartridge. Too long. The army wasn't willing to accept it. So instead they had to come up with a way to develop a polar flechette, or a polar sabo, that held the nose of the flechette and pulled it down the barrel. The problem with this is they, well, and the advantage here I should say, is they were able to basically pack the gunpowder around the body of the flechette, and that gives them a much shorter cartridge. Um, in the end they would develop something that was pretty similar in length to the 5.56 NATO cartridge. However, it took like five years of development to do this because they had to get the, the tension of that polar sabo just right. If it was too loose, if it didn't grip the, the flechette hard enough, the sabo would blow off in the barrel and then you'd have like bits of, of debris left in the barrel and your accuracy obviously went all to zero. If you had it too tight, uh, either it wouldn't release properly or it interestingly, at, at, when they started approaching 4,000 feet per second, which is really, really fast uh, in case you don't have a concept for this, uh, they actually were having problems with snapping the, the flechettes in half in the middle. Like the puller would be under so much pressure and such an instantaneous g-force that it would actually snap the flechette in half and only pull the front half out the muzzle. So. They finally managed to find the right equilibrium, the right tension, the right materials. They went for, it was like a glass nylon hybrid sort of strange material. They finally got it working in 1962, and that is when the army actually put out a request for Project Spew rifles. And that's, now finally we have gotten to the rifle that we're looking at today. Uh, four different companies were given contracts to develop these rifles. They were Winchester, which is what we have here. Also Harrington and Richardson, uh, probably as like, a, well you didn't do so well with the uh, M14, maybe you can do this better. Uh, Springfield Arsenal, the government arsenal, and also AAI themselves got a contract. And the requirements for this rifle were pretty optimistic. So all the usual stuff, it had to be lightweight, it had to be handy, it had to be safe, uh, it had to eject cases in such a way that it wouldn't interfere with shooting or with a guy shooting next to you. Uh, had to, what else, maximum overall length of 40 inches, all, all the normal stuff you'd expect, easy to disassemble. And then more substantially it had to carry a minimum of 60 rounds of point target ammunition, by which they mean flechettes or whatever other futuristic thing the companies decide to come up with, and it also had to carry three rounds of area effect ammunition. These rifles had to be built with grenade launchers built into them. Uh, and in fact, knowing that this would irreparably destroy the balance of any rifle, as it entirely has done here, the, the requirement was specific that the grenade launchers had to be removable, but could not be removed at the discretion of the rifle's user. So Private Snuffy was not allowed to take the grenade launcher off of his rifle, but the armorer had to be able to do it in case they wanted to. So um, with that requirement set up, Winchester came up with this rifle. Let's take a closer look at it. We'll start by taking a look at the rifle portion of this combined weapon. Um, this uses a three lug rotating bolt and it used a, uh, a gas tappet, a short stroke gas tappet action in order to cycle. So that's going to be hidden up here under the stock. The catch for the drum is actually right here and in order to release the drum you push forward on this lever and it actually uses the, uh, the trigger guard as a flat spring to provide tension for that. Um, also you can flip the trigger guard out of the way for shooting with gloves. These rifles were required to have uh, three position selectors. They had to be capable of semi-automatic fire, three round burst, well actually burst, they didn't specify how many rounds, uh, full automatic, uh, as well as a safe position. So this is your three round selector. You heard it click. This is kind of a weird finicky selector because this rifle fires from an open bolt in three round and full auto and from a closed bolt on single shot. And then it has a manual safety located up here 
that's safe and pulling the button forward is fire. There is also another button up here, and this is kind of an interesting solution. Uh, there's only one trigger for both the rifle and the grenade launcher, and the way you distinguished between the two was when you wanted to fire a grenade you had to hold this button down while pulling the trigger. As long as you did that it would fire a grenade instead of the rifle. So kind of an interesting, interesting and not necessarily a bad idea or a bad way to do that. We have a grenade launcher sight mounted on the side of the rifle, and that'll pivot down for various ranges. This had to be effective out to 400 meters, uh, and the rifle was actually also expected to be combat effective out to 400. Unfortunately, I'm not entirely sure how to disassemble this one. I know it's this lever which comes up, and then we can almost take this top assembly out, but the trigger gets stuck and I don't know. We, we spent a substantial amount of time, um, a couple of us here behind the camera and also myself, trying to figure out how to get this out and we just weren't able to figure it out. So we're going to be leaving that on. Now the other thing that made this rifle kind of unique and that was commented on in the, the trials was it had what they called a soft recoil system, which basically apparently is it comprises a second housing inside the action and the, the bolt and the recoiling components reciprocate in, first in this housing and then with it. The point I think is just to soften the recoil, to take up um, a bunch of the recoil energy before the bolt actually hits the back of the receiver and transmits that energy to the shooter. The idea is to make it flatter shooting, softer shooting. Um, apparently it didn't really work very well, and even when it did work, technically speaking, it didn't actually help much. So unfortunately that's all I have to go on about that because we aren't able to take it apart. So the recoil operating section of the, the action you can see right here, and note that the bolt is staying in place with the barrel, and if you look at the muzzle when I do that, you can see the barrel reciprocating backwards. And then the second phase of the recoil has a really stiff uh, like force you have to overcome. If I'm understanding this right, if I look inside there, it actually looks very much like uh, an FG42 or an M60 sort of system to me. I think that's what's going on here. And I think, if I can get this, there we go. I think what we're overcoming there is uh, the firing pin spring. So. This all comes back, like so, when it's open. And it is a three lug bolt up in here, uh, but they're very small lugs. And there it is back in battery. Now in addition to the grenade launcher, the rifles had to be able to mount a detachable bipod. And so Winchester went ahead and basically put an old VAR bipod on this. So we can, un we can loosen that pivot these legs out, tighten that back up. You can see this is technically removable uh, with a pair of screws. And they don't stay in place. Now I know you guys want to see the grenade launcher section here. What makes this really interesting is that this is actually a blow forward grenade launcher. It's chambered for the 40 millimeter high slash low um, pressure grenades like the M203 and the M79. Uh, the M79 was actually uh, adopted right during this time in 1960. So this ammunition was just coming into the military system when they were doing this development work. Now the way this works is we actually have a blow forward sleeve, well blow forward barrel inside uh, the, the receiver section here. So this is a spring loaded feed ramp. That's going to pop open like that. You can then load a cartridge in through one of these two feedways, either one, I believe. Then it will feed up into here and you lift this up, which allows the barrel to slide backward and chamber a grenade. You can then go ahead and load two more, one into each side. That gives you your three rounds of required uh, area target capacity. And then uh, when you fire, this thing is recoil operated. So I believe the idea is that when you pull the trigger, the barrel is going to tend to stay in place or and or 
be pulled forward by friction of the projectile uh, moving down the barrel, while the rest of the gun is going to want to go backward from the recoil. And that results in this whole thing cycling forward. There's a spring inside here that is old and the whole thing is stiff, so it shouldn't normally uh, stick like this, I don't believe. Uh, tension from this is also holding it in place. But when you fire, this thing, is, the, the rifle is going to recoil backward, this is going to get pulled forward, it will somewhere in there eject the empty 40 millimeter case. I suspect it just falls out because the, the case on one of these grenades is a lot shorter than the overall length. So the case fits in here where this will hold a full cartridge in position. Winchester was kind of specific that they they designed this to have a low bore axis without having to have a straight line stock. They wanted the traditional style of stock, so they made sure to mount the barrel as high up in the receiver as they could, and there isn't any extra hardware above the barrel. So you're able to have a sight that's actually not that tall, and the barrel pretty much comes back into your shoulder. It's kind of interesting to me that this is very clearly a uh, commercial sort of rifle sight that they were able to find and adapt with a new aperture there. And then the front sight is this big old shark fin type design. In testing it turned out this is really pretty much a terrible gun. Um, there was only one aspect of this that survived past the initial round of testing, and that was the blow forward grenade launcher, which would go on to be further developed for the next iteration of Springfield Armory's uh, SPIW rifle, which then consequently went nowhere. So ultimately all of this disappeared. But um, it, it's certainly a really interesting look at what the US military had in mind in the 1960s. And it's a fantastically cool rifle that I've, I've said sometimes that you know you have practical and you have cool and they're kind of inversely proportional to each other. This is an entirely cool rifle and turned out to be completely impractical in the field. The balance is awful, uh, the reliability was bad, the grenade launcher idea is neat, but this would have been a nightmare in the field. Um, but that doesn't make it any less cool. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. A big thank you to the Rock Island Arsenal Museum for allowing me to get my grubby hands on this thing and bring it to you guys. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more Forgotten Weapons. <laughs>